Brian, thank you so much for coming on to Startup Steroid today. I'm really excited to get to know your story, get to know Expert Dojo, and really get to learn the process that you go through to uh, build up the uh, companies that are part of your portfolio and sort of uh, companies that you're helping. Uh, but before we get into the whole story, uh, let's start with a quick introduction. Tell us a little bit about yourself. For sure. Thanks for having me. Wonderful to be here. I, you know, actually, before I go into that, my history with Ty, which obviously you're a member of and, and a great yep. fan of as well, goes back almost to the very beginning when we started getting investment. And, and that organization is, is so close to my heart all the way through. Another phenomenal organization in, in investing. I think I, we knew, I knew Ty before I, we'd even started investing. Um, and oh, wow. so, so on one side of it, I'm going to use just Thai as the organization to introduce me a little bit. So what I love about Thai is the fact of the democratization of the organization. No matter whether you're investing $5,000, $50,000, $100,000 or $5 million, you're welcome in the organization. Not only are you welcome, but as a member, your value is what you can contribute to the growth of the startup. And I really love that. But it's really very different to the current, the normal venture capital system of how a venture capitalist works, right? So I, I have lived in 40, 45 countries around the world. I've been very fortunate. Wow. I've had multiple businesses in those countries. I've lived in many, many, many places in the US from San Fran, Diego, to San Diego, um, Texas, and Dallas, and Houston, and Austin, and Chicago for a while, and Boston for ages, and New York, which is still my favorite city. I do love New York. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> it's best. I just, I can't pretend. I like it <laughs> a lot. I love the beach. I like the weather, but it's no New York. So, mm -hmm. I, um, so, I, so I had this very fortunate life where, where through my companies, I went to these places and I, and I chose to be a citizen of the world. And I arrived down here in Santa Monica about seven, eight years ago. And I noticed something very bizarrely that I'd never noticed before. And that is, that startups are failing at a crazy rate. And, and I know it may seem strange not to notice that because with the high failure rates, it's not exactly a secret, but maybe it just became obvious to me because I saw all these startups in a place and then they would all tell me their wonderful dreams and ambitions and hopes and everything else. And then nine months, 12 months time, they would be gone. And, and whether they've gone back to Ohio or Detroit or they've, they've, they've become an Uber driver, like I'm, I'm not sure, but it, it suddenly occurred to me is there a way that we can fix this? Like, is there something that we can learn from it? And I would say all the way up to that period of time, my life was very much just about enjoying everything that life had to offer. And then this, for the first time, I was perplexed by a challenge and a problem and something that I thought was incredibly unjust that these phenomenal people who are out there realizing, and actually it was explained to me very beautifully today that entrepreneurs are people who understand that in this tiny period that we have to live, that the most important thing they can contribute to the world is something that will live forever, right? Isn't that a beautiful thing? Yeah. Somebody said it to yeah. me earlier today. So in the context that that's what an entrepreneur represents, and then on the other side, 98% of them are gonna fail, it just seemed a little bit unfair. So I, I decided to dedicate these following years, which is pretty much the last seven or eight years, to doing what has now become Expert Dojo, the Accelerator. Fantastic, and, and such a great introduction to Expert Dojo. Uh, so uh, it's been around for seven or eight years. Uh, tell us what you've sort of accomplished. I, I know <laughs> the list is long, but uh, I really wanna know what, what, what's, uh, what that drive has sort of resulted. Uh, you, you, you sound like my wife now. <laughs> she said it with a slightly different tone of, and, I, and i say to her i say to her listen darling it it's early stage startup it takes a long time okay no 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 i completely understand and actually i take the opposite side i i i, I I, I'm aware of your accomplishment and I'm envious of that. So um. <laughs> I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. Look, look so we, 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 when I started off here, we didn't start off as right now. It's very simple. We're an international accelerator. We invest in companies from all over the world. We have over a hundred investments that we've made. Uh, some of our companies are just racing forward. We got some great success stories in India with companies like Unlu that we invested in five, six months ago, and they're already going for their Series A. 
our star yeah. news in Africa, who I was with earlier on today, same time period, and they're going for their Series A this year. And we have another seven or eight companies who are in the same space. Where our first investment was two and a half years ago, and now we're seeing those companies moving forward with really good metrics. And, and we've learned a lot on the journey, and our intention going forward is to invest in another 900 companies and really position ourselves as the gateway between the United States and the entire world as we bring it through. But we didn't start like that. Eight years ago, we started as a laboratory for entrepreneurs. And I really just wanted to understand what was causing the failure. And I had a lot of people around me who were friends and colleagues of mine in the space. And we all, we knew, we knew one undeniable truth. And that truth is that this system that we're in, which is a venture capital system, is a bias, racist, sexist, elitist system, right? Whereby on some levels, there are levels of a Ponzi scheme built into it, whereby if you're with one of the larger venture capital firms, you know that your relationship with the firms that are slightly further down the chain will dictate the success of a company, which is very sad in America. And it's why a lot of our great you know, league tables that we were in before, like America used to be the number one innovation co country in the world. Only 12 years ago, number one, as ranked by Bloomberg. And that was based on patents and it was based patents issued and it was based on density of tech and, and lots of other wonderful criteria. Now we're number 13 and we're falling down the rankings. Wow. Um, you know, and, it, and it's not even just about looking at China that have gone from nowhere to number 24, but also you look at the companies that are ahead of us in the ranking, Denmark, Sweden, Sweden, I mean, uh, just Norway, countries that should not be ahead of Switzerland. I mean, they should not be ahead of us, full stop. And the next thing we're going to see is like places like Estonia that are going to pass us as well. And, and why is this happening? It's happening because we have a collusive system that favors people who the venture capitalists want to make kings and queens. And actually, it's not even queens because queens don't get to play. It may, it's the guys of the venture capitalists want to make kings. And they all look the same and they're all the same age, generally speaking. And then they all get a unicorn for their birthday. And I'm generalizing on a great scale because there are some very good founders who do break through. But everybody has to deal with this unfair competitive system where great companies don't get to break through. And we could use a thousand examples. I could talk about WeWork and the money they got from SoftBank. I could even talk about Uber and the money that they got, that they still haven't turned a profit 12 years later. And the only thing that they do incredibly successfully is unfairly force out better competitors from the market by, uh, by unfair pricing. Right. So, so we, we know that we're in a system which is a really messed up system, uh, which is building all of the wrong uh, images for, for our kids to watch as to what's coming in the future. And I just wondered if we put together a laboratory, is there, is there a formula that we could find that will help ordinary founders who come from ordinary backgrounds, black, white, whatever their, their minority demographic, uh, female, male, whatever, whatever gender they are, um, are, are any other any other area that, that doesn't put them on the front line for being able to get institutional investment? Is there something that we could actually give to these people that would give them a chance of having a shot at the title? Um, and so we brought them into Expert Dojo, which is where I am right now, which is a place that we took on top of the mall. And we literally studied startups for a year. That's all. We didn't give them anything except for free rent. Or we didn't ask for anything except for data. And then we watched what they were doing. And we came up with four or five areas of concern stroke learns for us. Um, and they were in this order. Number one, we found that startups in general have a toxic relationship with investors. And what that means is rather than focusing on building great companies, they're focused on begging for money. And that's never a good start. Number two, startups have forgotten the, the, the art of branding. Um, and a lot of it is the cause of, of methodologies like Lean Startup, which has been misinterpreted in a terrible way. And people no longer feel like it's worth spending the time on building the beautiful art of creating phenomenal story around why we build our companies. And the problem with that is that if we don't build great stories, that means we're a commodity. And if we're a commodity, it means we compete with, alongside everybody else on the same level. And if that's the case, then it brings us back into the toxic relationship with investors because the only way we can win is by being able to raise money. A uh, third thing we found out was marketing has literally just turned into a game of Facebook ads. That's it. Nobody does anything else. They just do Facebook ads. 
And, and I wish that we could learn from some of the internet marketing geniuses of the past, like even the Tony Robbinses, who really understand funnel marketing, affiliate marketing, building different messages, automations, efficiencies, and actually creating proper channel marketing uh, strategies to build great companies rather than just throwing as much money as you possibly can at paid marketing. Um, right. And then the final area is, and this is the problem of our schools and our polit politicians and all those other awful people who just spend their entire days just trying to destroy the lives of entrepreneurs. And that's that they don't teach our kids how to start companies. And that Absolutely. is a travesty. And this is not about teachers. Teachers do what they're told. This is about the officials who actually instigate this awful, failed education policy they give our kids. And I know my kid comes home from school every single day dumber than when he went to school. And then we have to get him somebody to teach him for like two hours to try and undumb him from what he's got when he went to school. And as I said, I want to really emphasize, it's not teachers. Teachers are amazing. It's that they're not teaching us what, uh, and they don't have a curriculum that teaches us what we need to learn to survive today. It's not the Absolutely. same. It's the curriculum. It's the curriculum is, uh, is old, it's outdated, and uh, isn't effective in the environment that we're living in now. And anyway, sorry, I go off on a tangent sometimes. <laughs> I feel so strongly about how yeah. bad it is. And then we just said, okay, we've worked out these three or four things which we know are huge problems. Can we build a program that will actually help uh, actually deal with them and come up with some form of solution. So we built a program, which we then tested for about two years or so. Then we brought in a bunch of mentors. We brought in a, bro a bunch of folks around us who also believed in the same cause. And then we've decided at that stage, okay, we're going to have really a couple of foundations to what we want to create in Expert Dojo. The first foundation is that we represent ordinary people with extraordinary abilities and talents and strength. Now that will mean that we don't, I don't want to balance the playing field. I don't want rich people to be less rich. I want to tilt it up. I want folks who deserve to be rich to be, have the same ability to be rich as people who are rich already, right? And that's not just startups, that's also investors, which I know we'll, we'll talk about later on. The second area is that we want to create a world uh, uh, of success, not just a district of success where certain folks get access to it, like, I don't care where the entrepreneurs are. I don't care if they're in Mumbai. I don't care if they're in London. I don't care if they're in Dublin. I don't care where they are. What I care about is what is their aspiration to be able to build a great company? And can we help with that ability and help them get there? Um, and then the final part of it is that we want to make sure that our education becomes an enabling factor to getting them there. Now, the fact that we know investors and we can introduce them to investors is a side point. The main area is that we will help educate and provide that platform for the entrepreneurs to be able to get there. So right now, we invest $100,000 into companies unless they want less. And we can invest up to a million dollars into companies afterwards. Uh, we provide that entire education platform. And I am with them every step of the journey through the entire program. And then we've got strategy people who are working alongside them, investment people working alongside them, and then growth hackers who are also working alongside them. And all we want to do is to be able to take companies and then to be able to increase the amount of revenue our users or whatever traction metric they're using to an extent where we hit a number where bias is replaced by FOMO and greed. Because when that happens, yep. then we create unicorns or whatever greatness that that company was expected to get to. And that's the journey we're on right now. And as I said, we're, we're, we're pretty early. We're two and a half years in on our first investment. And um, valuations in the ins of the investments based on last valuation by other investors are up three, 400%. Uh, we're really pleased with the companies coming through. We learn every single day from these companies. And the one thing that hasn't changed is we are growth, 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 growth. That's it. Yep. Fantastic. And you've done a great job laying out what uh, Expert Dojo's mission is and what you're trying to achieve with the founders. So I, I completely understand that accelerator mindset. But what I don't understand is that now you're on WeFunder raising capital for Expert Dojo. So tell me a little bit about what you're trying to achieve uh, with WeFunder and the campaign that you're starting now. 
Wonderful. So, you know, the first thing is absolutely everything is a journey, right? And the journey is to a place of enlightenment because we're, we're a dojo. So it's not so much just about making money. Look, we, we have a fund. I'm the general partner. If anybody knows how venture capital firm works, there's a general partner. And not, normally there are many, many, many limited partners. In our particular case, I'm the general partner and my partner is the limited partner. And my partner is one of the wealthiest guys in California, and he is entirely committed to fund up to two, 300 companies, whatever we need to do. And we have a phenomenal relationship, and we work together every day to find the brightest and the best companies and help bring them into the dojo portfolio. So it's not because money is needed for a fund. We funded the first 100 companies. We're going to fund the next right. 200 companies, 300 companies. Actually, I'm very fortunate because I don't need to go through what most general partners need to go through. I don't need to fundraise right. to replace someone who I have tremendous respect and love for as a, uh, as a limited partner. So we're in really good shape. However, if we look to what our mission is, our mission is to tilt up startup from a 360 perspective. And that means that whether it's the startup, the ordinary people with extraordinary abilities, or whether it's investors, who are also extraordinary people who have extraordinary expectations. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that like, the world is very unfair. And it's very unfair because if you're poor, you're told. And when I say poor, I mean if you don't have enough money that you can sit on a Saturday afternoon Relatively. and not have to worry about money, then you're poor, right? And, if you, and that right. means you're 90% of all people in America, right? So if you're poor, you're told by the government because you're not an accredited investor, then you can't really invest in early stage startups or anything which has any ability for exponential returns. And what that means is you put your money in the bank and it's just horribly sad. You know, mm -hmm. so you're going to get 1% returns, half a percent returns. Inflation is more than you're going to get back every single year. Your only alternative is to go to Robin Hood where you have absolutely no impact on what's going to happen in a share. You gamble. And okay, it's not. And you have, yeah, no control. So it's literally gambling. And, that, and you just hit it, right? Control is the total point. Like if you're not, my dad used to say to me, he, he loved his poker and he would say, Whenever you're going to play poker, you walk to that poker table and you find the patsy. And if you can't find the patsy, that means <laughs> you're you. the patsy. <laughs> <laughs> yep. so, so you have to have control. I mean, if you're going to bet on a football match, well, make sure it's your team or make sure you're playing in the match. Like, or if you're going to, but if you go to the stock market and you make a bet on IBM and you know nothing about what's happening inside IBM, like what? in your mind made you think like that's a good decision, but because they have no choice, that's where they are. So I believe in the same way that great startups who have the ability to build unicorns deserve to be tilted up to a place where they can do it themselves. I believe that investors deserve exactly the same thing right now. They don't get to play in the venture capital game. We know that the wealthiest people on the planet are made wealthy because of venture capital, whether it's Elon Musk, whether it's Bill Gates, whether it's um, our, our, our friend um, over, I was going to say Bernie Metal, um, <laughs> our, our, our friends over in all of those other wonderful places like the Steve Jobs of the world back in the day, they yeah. all made their money from venture capital. We know how much money can be made from this space. So mm -hmm. I want to make sure that the education is built out and I want to give people the opportunity to be able to make, uh, make money from Expert Dojo success in the future. Nothing is ever certain in these things, but I would not have done this four years ago when we were extremely risky and we did not have companies. Now that we have 100 companies in our portfolio, now that we're growing at a size, now that we're the third largest investor in America by deal numbers, we're suddenly in a place where we feel like we're in a really strong place and we have all these new companies coming through. Now look, our end game is that we will tokenize our entire portfolio. We will get to a thousand companies, assuming that we get there. We will then tokenize the whole portfolio, which means that anybody anywhere in the world is able to have an ownership stake in a thousand companies. And that means they get the benefits of the thousand companies. Now, do I think that Expert Dojo is the absolute 100% best investment opportunity within the early stage space? No, I don't. But I right. think there should be a lot more people playing in this space. And I think that we're, we're a relatively de-risked option for them to get started on. 
but I believe that this is just the beginning. I think regulation crowdfunding coming through is just the start. I believe that blockchain allows us to track everything that's going to happen and tokenization allows us to create an economy inside that. And where I would love to go to is that we create this entire token economy whereby let's say Jimmy who's based over in Arkansas and we say that, and Jimmy happens to be very good friends with the person over in Walmart. And let's say Jimmy then realizes that there's a company in our portfolio that has got the most delicious beverage drink in the world. We actually do have one called Hickama, right? Yeah. So let's say that Jimmy says, I think Hickama would be a great drink for my friend John over in Walmart. And then they call John in Walmart and Jimmy says, John, this lady called Mona owns Hickama. Great brand, you should speak to her. Now let's then say that John over in Walmart loves the brand and starts working directly with the brand. Now Mona is going to be incredibly grateful to Jimmy for making that introduction. So today, there is no financial compensation for Jimmy for having done that. I want to build that economy inside Expert Dojo, whereby that if we can get folks to actually directly impact the growth of our companies, they will be given tokens. And those tokens will have a value. Nice. Now we got an economy. That's fantastic. And it's all about access, as you described it. It's fantastic. And now uh, the 90% of the population that's not accredited investors get to take benefit uh, of these, uh, these startups and companies that are growing exponentially and benefit from it. That, that's a fantastic mission. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, the process. You know, the, uh, I'm sure you get hundreds and thousands of applications. Um, how do you pick the right companies for your portfolio? What, what does that process look, look like? So th this would be good for all of you listeners because there's yep. four criteria for me, four main criteria and then kind of a, a tiny extra criteria. So whenever we're looking at a company, number one, first thing I would look at is the skill gapping within the company. So for example, if somebody's building a, tech, a technical product and they have no technical person in the team, then they're doing it maybe over in, it could be India or Poland, it could be Ireland, it could be anywhere. Then I'm going to look very unfavorably at that, not just because I don't like that country for that particular development, because that's not the problem. The problem is not the work that they do. The problem is the direction they receive. And if a, ter if a technical person or a strong product person is not giving that direction, the chances are a poor user experience will be built. Right now, I use the example with tech. But it could be to do with sales, it could be to do with human resources, it could be to do with finance if it's a fintech product. I look at skill gapping and say, I need these people to be able to make it through two rounds after me. Do they have the skills to be able to get through those rounds? Right. That's the first thing. The second thing I look at is, what does their market size look like? Now, that sounds very generic. For me, numerically, I'm looking for a market size that can do $10 million a month in revenue are I can get up to 10 to 20 million users. Now, if I can get to a million dollars a month in revenue, I'm still gonna look at it because I know that's still a 30, $50 million company. But if we want a company that has the potential to reach a billion dollar valuation, then we wanna make sure it can do at least $10 million a month in revenue. Now, you may say to me, well, Brian, that's very greedy of you because you're taking in these companies at a couple of million dollars. Like, why do you need it to go all the way to a billion? And it's because of how the game is played. And there are no different players at different levels. So we're in the pre-seed stage, but then there are other folks at the seed stage, maybe where a company is $10 million valuation. Then there are other folks at the Serious A stage. And when you start getting to the Serious A stage, then you need to make sure they won't invest if they don't see that the company can be a billion dollar company. And what that means is the person at the seed stage won't invest if they can't get the person at the A stage to invest yep. and so on and so on. So we need to make sure the company can be big. Now, from our side of it, we also need to make sure that the founder has the ability to execute on the marketing plan that we are going to implement or help implement for that company. And then the final area is that we want to make sure that we got a good fundraiser. So I literally just finished with one of our startups where he said, I'm too busy. We have too much on. I'm too overwhelmed for my team. I cannot distract my team from fundraising. And I said to him, you cannot not distract the team from fundraising. You have to understand, you're building a great company. God bless you. You should not have gone down the venture capital road. You should have gone down the, I'm building a great company for my kids road. You go down the venture capital road, you sure as heck better be in here for the fast game. 
Yep. Not the long game, the fast game. This is a choice that you make. So I want to make sure that we've got people who at least can be trained and educated at that level. Now, I'll give you a very real example of a company that we had where, 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 where this is where I just want to make sure that nobody walks away with a black and white picture of this and they understand that there are shades of gray all the way through. I had this one particular founder, an incredible company which predicts outcomes based on behaviors within video. Phenomenal, right? Only wow. technology I've ever seen anywhere that's able to do this. We checked out the technology. We love it. The founder is terrible at, pitch, at, at pitching, at fundraising. Just terrible. Awful. Maybe, maybe one, two out of ten, right? For lots of reasons. Just not her skill set, not, not an area, not very good at it. Right. However, her technology and the market potential for that technology is a ten out of ten. Skill gapping. Skill gapping is a problem because she doesn't have strong business development people or marketing people in her team to be able to do it. Great tech team, but poor on the sales side. So again, that's a two out of 10. But the company is able to grow up to $100,000 a month, which can get them up to that $10 million a month in revenue as well. Mm -hmm. And I can see that as long as I put the right marketing team in the company, which means I've got an eight, seven, an eight, and nine out of 10 there. So hopefully what folks listening will realize is you don't have to be 10 on everything. Yep. We just have to work out by inserting certain people and working a tiny bit harder on it, that you have mm -hmm. the ability to be able to build this up to that $10 million a month in revenue. That's really the one that, that this is all about. And just remember, this is all in the context of the fact that every startup founder on the venture road is facing three battles at the same time. One raising equity, one driving revenue, and one against, which is speed against time. The yep. truest enemy of all three is the one is time itself. Yep. You are in a race every single day. If you win that race against time, you will, you will win both of the other battles as well. Fantastic. So this is, this is exactly the type of you know, companies that I look for as well. I invest at the next level, at the seed stage level, and I'm looking for companies that go to Series A, Series B, uh, and you nailed it when you described that process. So if uh, there are investors out there, then now you know exactly what kind of companies Brian is investing in, which is fantastic. Brian, let me ask you a, a question about uh, the, the skill set within the company. You already mentioned you know, the technical uh, capabilities of the founder um, and how they can either you know, if they are six or seven, you could probably get them up to an eight or a nine or get someone else in there that can sort of help them with certain skill sets. But what are the skill sets that, or, or let me put it the other way in a negative context. If these are the skill sets that are in the company, they will, they will sincerely harm the company or if not destroy the company. So what are those negative things or red flags that, uh, um, that you look for to avoid? Ego can be a terrible curse. Ego. It really can. It can be so hurtful to founders. And there's a feeling that, that you need to be strong. Um, and there's a, there actually is a difference between confidence and strength. And for me, it's about being able to build up. You can build up the strength over time. But if you can have confidence when you walk in, it's, it's, and, and confidence actually means you get to the opposite of ego. It's a really beautiful journey. Like if you, if you get really strong, confident people, then those people then are always looking for other people to help them get stronger. You know, if you get people who believe they're very strong already, challenges, it's that whole, you know, com conscious and competent and unconscious competent and, and that journey that you go through there, it can be very, very hard to convince them that they're wrong. Um, and it doesn't mean that you're right. It's just like I literally wake up every single day with the assumption that I'm wrong about everything and wanting to be proven wrong. And it doesn't mean that I'm not attacking the market from a position of being right. But every time I attack the market, I'll say to you, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to launch 10 accelerator programs. We're going to have each program is going to be focused on, on blockchain and healthcare and all these things. This is what I'm going to do. And you'll be like, oh, that's great, Brian. And I'll say, it's what I'm going to do, but I would love if you could tell me a reason why it's not going to work. Right. You know? And it's not because I'm going to change my mind. It's not because I'm going to stop it. Because, but it's because I want to be the smartest entrepreneur on the planet. And whether I'm a venture capitalist or an entrepreneur, I'm still an entrepreneur. 
I'm still driving my business forward for the benefit of my stakeholders. And that means that I owe my stakeholders the obligation of making sure that I'm making the very best choices I can. And that means that I'm making informed choices. And sometimes you just get folks who come through and they're so sure of what they're doing. And they're not aware of the fact that it's an evolving process that requires a lot of people to help you get there. So ego, ego is a terrible curse. Absolutely. That's a fantastic answer. And, and I think the, the next step of that is being coachable, in my opinion, that, uh, you know, that I think that that's you sort of uh, uh, touched on that, but being able to take external advice and incorporating in that, incorporating that in, in your company, in your vision and improving your, uh, your vision uh, because of it. I think that, that that's sort of the next level uh, of that. Um, now, I know we're coming to a close and I know you have to get back to your companies. Um, let me ask you the last question, which is the action step. Um, a lot of founders are listening to it. They want to apply to Expert Dojo. They want to be part of your accelerator. What is the one thing that they have to have before they make that call or before they send you the email? Um, if they don't have this, game over. Don't even bother uh, starting that conversation. What is that one thing for you? So I will say, let me give a little bit of a long answer to this because okay. I want to create the context of what entrepreneurship is and maybe share, shed some light on, on why I even mentioned about ego and all those other things as well. When any of us start a journey, a new journey of entrepreneurship, a lot of people have previously talked about the fact that we pivot or we change, and I don't believe any of us pivot. I believe what happens is this. I believe we start a company, and at the very beginning, on that first day, our company is maybe 12% complete. Maybe some people it's 7%, some people it's 13%, maybe 11 or 12%. And our job every single day is to get the company to a more complete stage. Because if you think about it, it's impossible to be more complete than 12% because you just invented this. It didn't, it didn't exist before. So it's, right. not like, it's not like we're tracing something. We're building it from scratch. And by doing that, it means that you have to continually search. You're doing two things at the same time. Number one, you're adapting different skills at different times during this process. And the second thing is you're continually looking to try and move from 12 and a half to 13 and 13 to 13.5. And that doesn't mean that you achieve stuff. Many times you fail massively. And if you learn and you listen and you adapt and you move forward, that can bring you from a 12 to a 14% complete. So that mindset, of continually searching for that excellence, that elusive 70, 80% complete company, that in itself is a superhero skill that will require other people to help you on that journey. That's the first point. The second point is you don't need to be all things to all people. So we'll, we, will, we, we use analogies or we use descriptors when we're talking to entrepreneurs about the skills they require at different levels of the journey. So we'll say at the very first level, we want you to be a Viking, right? Now, a Viking just needs to know a couple of things, right? You don't need to be a brilliant sh um, uh, shipbuilder and you don't need to dress in beautiful clothes. The only thing you need to do is grab a couple of your friends, get into a boat, scare the heck out of everybody on the island that you're going over to because they've heard stories, which is your brand, about you sharpening your teeth with a knife as you're coming across, and how you eat the hearts out of children. So by the time you arrive in that village, which you would have had to have a fight with a thousand people, and everybody has run away scared because they know you're coming. So the skills of outreach and the skills of brand and the skills of communication are unbelievably important when you are launching a company at the very beginning. And then what happens is you then get to a stage which is coming close to your seed round, whereby the villagers kind of know you're coming. And one of the villagers said, why don't we just like throw a big stone out in the ocean and sink their boat? Like, wouldn't that save us having to run away every single time and then have them steal from us? So you need to move from being a Viking to being a gladiator. And a gladiator has got process. It has efficiency. It has a structure that allows them to build a company, not based on you fighting all the time, but having you having operational prowess in place that allows you to build from a strong foundation. And that means that you're building your operation strength. 
It means that you're building your human resources strength. It means that you're focusing on fundraising in a way whereby you're a grown up now. You're not just begging for money. You're showcasing what's going to be built in the future. And you're building your influence as a startup. I would argue that Expert Dojo are still in that phase of being in the gladiator phase. Ourselves, never, never mind our startups. You then move into the next phase. And the next phase is Knights of the Round Table. And that's that when every single person around that table has a skill set stronger than you in their area of discipline, marketing, mm -hmm. technology, human resources, all of the other the disciplines that you require around that table. And then you get to the sensei stage. And the sensei stage is when you're really the guy who sits in the room in the corner and people walk by the room and they say, what, what does he do? Uh, or what does she do? And they're like, oh, he's the founder of the company. Very nice guy. Say hello to him when he's going out to grab himself a cup of tea. He likes to keep company with people. Okay? So you need to follow that foundation as a company. So when you come to us as a founder, I want to see a founder that's prepared to go through those two journeys. That they're building with, they're building with smarts, with emotional intelligence, not necessarily um, IQ. And they understand the journey, the, the resilience that's going to be required to build a company from that 12.5% all the way up to that 70%. And by understanding it and showing me, not just that they have a great product, not just that they've got a great idea, not just that they know how to sell, but that they're able to walk on these two parallel paths and take it all the way to the very end. That's what we want to see. Fantastic. Such a great description and such a great sort of metaphor to help us understand, you know, uh, the process and what you look for in, in startups. Uh, Brian, thank you so much for coming on today and sharing uh, Expert Dojo's story, your story uh, with us. I really appreciate it. Uh, any parting thoughts? Just do this. You know, if you're thinking of starting up, start up. If you're a startup, work harder at it. If you did a startup before, do another startup. This is how you change the world and how you make the world a better place. Fantastic. Such great advice. Just do this. Get it done. Let's go. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, with that, we'll call it a day. Uh, I appreciate you coming on today. Uh, I, I will let you get back to your companies and uh, guiding them to success and uh, wish you all the luck in the future. Oh, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you.